Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Today we're going to be talking about several different issues related to public education, both K-12 as well as higher education, and what better to have talking about education than a public school teacher himself. Representative Greg Amore, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Jim. I'm happy to be here. So before we start talking about legislation, uh, let's uh, get a little bit of background on you. First of all, I know you've only been in the Assembly since 2012, but what got you involved in politics in the first place? I, I had always been interested in politics. I, I, my background is in public policy, so that's what my master's degree uh, is in. But, but I, I, I wrote a column for the local newspaper for probably about six years before I ran. And I was starting to get disturbed with the concept that the economic downturn in our country was, was due to uh, teachers and firemen and policemen and middle class working people. Um, and, and that narrative started to stick. And my decision to run in part was to try to change that narrative and in part was to try to uh, bring some, so a reasonable voice to education reform because education reform, so-called reform, had started to go down a path that, that I thought was, was damaging, and, and I was correct, it has been damaging. So you teach in the same place where you went to school. You're a, you're a townie and you are a graduate born, of East, East Providence Born High and school. raised, yes, born okay. and raised. And I coached uh, both the baseball and hockey teams there for uh, just about 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been in the same classroom at East Providence High School for 24 years. Oh, well, good for so, you. So, yeah, it's, it feels like I never left. When I, when I came back as a teacher, a lot of my teachers were still there. I had a hard time figuring out what to call them. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, you know, <laughs> Mister. Don't call me call me Jim. And it was difficult, but uh, I'm kind of a fixture there now, and, and I and I still love it. I still enjoy going into class. I still enjoy the teaching and the prep, and I just uh, I'm passionate about teaching, um, and that's why I've stayed in the classroom for so long. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there's always people that have said to me, "You should go into administration or uh, guidance," and I, I just I enjoy teaching. Well, good for you. And you're busy <clears throat> as a legislator. I know you're you serve on not one, not two, but three different committees in the House of Representatives, finance, HEW, as well as uh, municipal government. How do, you, how do you juggle all that, <laughs> as well as being a full-time teacher? It's, uh, it's difficult. I, I, would, I would say that if, if I was in my first 10 years teaching, this would be impossible. Um, I teach the Advanced Placement U.S. History, and I teach in American Civics and Government that I've taught for a number of years. So I'm, I'm usually pretty prepared for the class. I have work to do. I try to set aside that time. But as I said before, I coach two sports in back-to-back -back seasons for almost 20 years. So the time differential is not, is not that great. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different type of time. Uh, it's a different type of preparation, but, uh, but it's, it's kind of the same. And my, my uh, oldest daughter said to me, Dad, you've signed up for too many things. And I said, ever since you were born. So <laughs> it hasn't changed. But, it's your, uh, if it's your personality, you have I, to I be I enjoy it. I like being on the go. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I like being involved. So it's, not a, it's a labor of love. Good for you. So you put in a couple of different interesting bills, and for the first time, we had legislation this year that would codify in state law a parent's ability to opt out of standardized tests for their for their children, and and the bill also ensured that there were some kind of rules and regulations along with that. Right. Why, why don't you let our viewers know why you introduced that bill this year? So what we've seen around the country is a movement by parents to remove their students from common core based tests and for a number of reasons. So some parents are interested in the idea that this is a top down federal mandate that they don't want to be involved in. That would be our friends on the right. Uh, for people who, who I deal with, uh, educators in the classroom, 
they believe that there's a whole, uh, a whole host of testing that is unnecessary and that the, the testing that, that we're doing in relationship to Common Core, one, we're not prepared for. The Commissioner of Education will always talk about how we uh, implemented Common Core over five years ago. The reality is that Common Core in the classroom has not been implement, implemented fully until just last year in most districts. So it's, it's not true to say that we've been at this five years, but even if we were at it for five years, we wouldn't be ready for a common core tied test uh, at, at this point in time. So between that and the pushback that we saw in the pilot states, New York in particular, uh, parents decided that, you know, my, my child is in front of a computer for nine or 10 or 11 hours of testing. Uh, they're being tested in their classrooms. There are assessments in their classroom. Mm -hmm. There are other tests. When you get to the high school level, you're talking about advanced placement tests. In Rhode Island, we have a kneecap science test. So the education reform movement has kind of based the entire uh, movement on the idea that we can have accountability for students and teachers through testing. And so we began to overtest. What I had hoped was that the Rhode Island Department of Education was going to set up some rules so that parents could, one, know they could opt out, and two, could opt out easily and still have their child in a, an educational setting where they were being engaged. And I, and I kind of let that go for a while uh, to see how the districts were responding. So where I teach in East Providence, the districts allowed parents to opt out. They, they suggested that the principals talk to the parents and, and talk to them about what the values of the testing were, but there was no pressure beyond that. They told the, the parents that their students would be engaged in some sort of educational activity as best they could considering the size of our school and the number of computer labs. Mm -hmm. So that happened in Tiverton, it happened in some other places, but what we found was that in some districts, parents were being denied the right to opt their child out. If they insisted on opting their, chi opting their child out, the, the superintendent would call the parent, uh, have a meeting with the parent, and in some cases say, look, your child's not gonna be able to graduate if they don't participate in this uh, testing. Now, there is no state law that requires you to participate. Uh, as you know, we passed the moratorium last year on the graduation requirement, standardized testing. And, uh, and even RIDE <clears throat> administrators themselves acknowledge that parents have rights and that students don't have to take a test. We, we don't sure. point a gun, uh, a proverbial gun in someone's head and said you have to do this, you have to take this test. So even the, even the administrators of the test themselves over at the Department of Ed agree that parents have rights to opt Sure, and we've, and we've heard them convey that a number of different times in a number of different ways, but the, the memos that were coming from RIDE to direct school departments were very foggy. Uh, they were very unclear. They were, I think, unclear on purpose. I think they would, they would have rather had the communities, the districts, take responsibility here and kind of wash their hands of the whole thing. The reality is it was so inconsistent from district to district that the decision was made on my part. Again, I had constituents that asked me to uh, put this bill in long before I did. Uh, my decision was, look, let's try to get a, a, a one statewide opt-out form that one is available and that parents know is available and that we have districts know that if these ch children do opt out, then they are going, they're gonna face no consequences from the district. They'll be able to uh, what, do whatever they have to do to be engaged in the classroom. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because parents know their rights. Uh, parents, parents know that they make choices for their uh, children all the time. We, we have a special education process where an indiv individualized education plan is designed, and that plan does not go into effect until a parent signs off on that. Um, so, so it's not inconsistent to think that a parent has some rights here. Now, if I decide not to take an algebra test, well, I know that that, that has some consequences, right? If I don't take the test and I, and I don't make the test up, then I'm gonna get zero on that test. That's gonna affect my overall grade. In this case, what I believe to be the case is that we are creating a data system for schools and for students and for teachers. And the idea is to use that data uh, to sort and label schools and students and to evaluate teachers. And when you put that all together, there's nothing reformy about that. That has, that has nothing to do with education reform. Mm -hmm. I would love to have a conversation about real education reform, uh, you know, pre-K, wraparound services, uh, trying to intervene very early on, uh, language acquisition, uh, stopping chronic absenteeism. All things that would have a, a really big impact where we, where we know we struggle, right? Where, where our students are in poverty in our 
most at-risk districts. But that's not what this conversation is about. This conversation is a pretend conversation about accountability. And the reality is, how accountable am I as a teacher for a student that I might get in my classroom at, let's say, a grade 8 reading level? And I might move that uh, student to a grade 9 reading level, but my test might be a grade 11 test or 10 test. Mm -hmm. I, I, that movement isn't shown. Uh, so I'm going to be graded on that student's movement on this test, even if that test is appropriate. And Jim, we don't even know if the test is appropriate. It has been piloted. We got no feedback from the pilot last year. We have it uh, running this year. Um, we don't know what the cut score will be. Uh, and, and this was supposed to be a national uh, test, right, between the two common core consor consortium. I would have imagined that the cut score was, was going to be common, but the cut score is not common. That's going to be up to the individual states. We, we don't even know if these tests are appropriate. I know that by looking at um, some of the released items, so I can only talk about what Park has released, and some of these questions on the English language art section are well above the Lexile reading levels of the students that are taking them. And I don't know if that prepares a child for college and career if we're forcing that child to reach beyond where they're capable of reaching at this point. The biggest, the biggest problem is context. There's a sample question that I looked at where I answered the questions. It was uh, Robert Oppenheimer who worked on the atomic bomb pro project, Manhattan Project, and he was giving a speech to fellow scientists. That was the text. A and it's, it's offered to these students with no context. Now, if you were in my classroom and I covered the Manhattan Project and the, uh, the growth of atomic uh, bombs, energy, the whole thing, then you'd have some context for that. So when you read it, you'd be able to more easily answer those questions. These students are getting this fresh, a close read, and they're supposed to put it in context, I guess, and figure out what to do with it. And I think what we know is vocabulary is the key to these tests. They're, in essence, vocabulary tests. Um, and we know that students in high-risk high districts, students uh, who come from difficult backgrounds, students whose parents' education levels are not uh, beyond high school, struggle with these types of tests. It doesn't mean that they can't get to where they're going, but this test is going to label them whatever. We don't know what it's going to be yet. Mm -hmm. It's going to label their teacher and their school, and we've got to move away from this because it's, we're going in the opposite direction where we should be going for real reform. So I sat in on the bill hearing, and there was considerable parent support from different communities throughout the state of Rhode Island. Um, what, have you, what are you hearing from parents about, about the need to have a state law, for example? I, I've received a number of emails, even before I put this in. I guess I'm the education guy there, so I get contacted not only by parents, but by uh, school administrators who, who would like to remain uh, anonymous, and they'd rather, you know, talk to me about uh, the value of this. But, but par parents are coming from every different point of view. Some are coming from the point of view of a parent with a child with special needs. Some are a parent with, uh, who are a, a parent of English language learners. Some are parents of students who they think are having their curriculum narrowed by this focus on testing. And I think that's a big issue. And we don't talk about that much, but if well, you're always well, testing... Explain, explain that to our viewers. What do you mean by narrowing the curriculum? Sure. So th these tests test math and they test English, to, to put it simply. Mm -hmm. There's a writing component on the English side. Uh, math, when you get to the higher grades, are based on the subject matter. But they don't test anything else. So mm -hmm. if you're an elementary uh, teacher and you're trying to get your students from point A to point B on these tests, then you're focused on test prep in math and ELA. And so what gets lost is science and social studies, the arts, uh, and the curriculum gets narrowed. And what happens is in places where students struggle, their, their educational experience becomes prepping for math and ELA. And they lose out on all those other things. I, I've heard horror stories about music programs being shut down, about students not being exposed to any social studies until they're in fifth or sixth grade based on this test prep. So I think a lot of parents are concerned that, you know, I'd like to have my son or daughter have a comprehensive education and really explore some different subjects besides these tested subjects. Another aspect of the whole standardized test um, problem we have in this state is costs associated with it. And I know you've put in uh, some legislation that, that takes a look at, at uh, you know, what resources are being used up to have all these different standardized tests. Why don't you let our viewers know a little more about that so, legislation? So this bill would require the Department of Education 
to uh, get data from each of the districts as to how much it costs to implement uh, these tests uh, and the standards, and then how much it costs to actually take the test. Uh, and is, it the, is it the standardized test from the state park, it or is, is the, it any No, this, this is narrowed down to the standardized assessments. In fact, this, this one says park or, an, or a like assessment, uh, just in case we switch to a, to a different test, which is very possible as more and more states drop out of park. Um, so, and Ride will tell, tell you that, oh, we have that data. Well, they have the data from the statewide perspective, and they have what it costs per student to take the test, but what they don't have is the costs in upgrading technology. What they don't have in, is the costs in covering classrooms for teachers who are proctoring the tests. What they don't have is the costs in professional development. What they don't have is the costs in uh, preparing a, a, a class, the hours that it takes a building administrator to prepare a schedule to implement these tests. And I, and I will assure you, it's hours upon hours upon hours. And then you have to bring in substitute teachers in some districts to, to cover classrooms or to cover the tests, and the, it starts to build. Uh, I know of one district that said, uh, not a big district, that told me that it was going to cost them $250,000 uh, to run these tests this year. Um, so we have, a lot of, we have a lot of needs in Rhode Island. Uh, one of them is infrastructure. And I look at, at the cost of this testing, and I say, how many places can we better use this money? How about transporting Providence students to school who live beyond a mile rather than two and a half miles? I mean, that would be a really good way to spend mm -hmm. that money. So this is going to narrow down as to what it actually costs to implement and then to actually give the tests. And you had the hearing on that bill as well. We, th that has been heard as well, and that, that was well received. Uh, I, think, I think there are a lot of my colleagues that want to know those answers because they're worried about their taxpayers as well. And uh, what are we doing here to take care of the taxpayers' interest in this, uh, which is always a concern? Uh, and, and, and let's be transparent. Let's, let's tell people exactly how much it costs. Sure. So the, another interesting education bill off the subject of standardized tests is some legislation you put in on higher education costs. Why don't you let our viewers know uh, what spurred you on and, and what your legislation does? Sure. Uh, I teach in East Providence, so I meet a lot of kids who are unsure about what they're going to do going forward in, in higher education. They're good students. Uh, they, they're, you know, they're going to college. They're just not sure what they're going to college for. And many of them are going to have to work a part-time job, or even maybe more than a part-time job, just to get themselves through college. So I put a bill in that would grant uh, qualified students, and to be qualified, you'd have to be in the top 15% of your class. You'd have to have at least the state average on the SAT or ACT, uh, and you'd have to have 95% uh, attendance rate. So we're talking about kids that it's, it, they're a good risk. If we spend this money to give them a two-year grant to CCRI, they're a really good risk because we know they're going to go to school, we know they're going to work hard at it, we know they've got a track record of success, and what it, what it hopes to do is benefit that, that student who's not quite sure where they want to go. They, they probably have to work their way through school. This takes some of that burden away, uh, and it allows them to kind of take those first two years and not have any debt associated with those two years of school, maybe not worry about working so much worry about getting it through. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, an incentivized plan that would allow that, that borderline kid, uh, and, and many of them I teach in my district, to kind of uh, get a head start and not have so much debt going forward. Kind of all, uh, aligned, if you will, with what President Obama pitched a few months ago about finding a way for this country to provide for two years of public education for everyone. But yours is much more narrow in, in it scope is, and, than that. It is, and mine is more narrow for two reasons. One, this is Rhode Island, and we have a, a serious budget issue. Uh, and two, I, th I think there needs to be some incentive uh, for, for a student who sees this, they enter high school as a freshman, and they see this as an opportunity. Hey, you know, if I keep my grades up to a certain level, so 15% of East Province High School, you'd be number 75 in your class. And you say, okay, I, I can do that, and, and I know that this will be here for me, and I can kind of figure out where I'm going and then pursue the four-year degree, or just get the two years, get an associate's in whatever it might be, and start earning. So it's, it's similar. Look, we, we know that one of the big problems we have is debt, uh, massive, massive debt that students mm -hmm. are graduating with that kind of tie their hands and I think hurts our economy overall because they're, uh, they're stuck with this debt. They really can't buy a house. They can't buy a car, et cetera, et cetera. We all see that in all aspects of, uh, of our economy, where young people challenged with, n you know, not, not thousands, but tens of thousands sure. of dollars I, I in think debt, the, hold them back. The average number, the average number is $23,000 
today. So students are graduating $23,000 worth of debt. That's, that's t and many, many are graduating with much more than that. That's a tough thing to carry with you, trying to then start a career and, and your life. Sure. So do you know the price tag on this CCR we have We have not uh, gotten the fiscal note on this yet because it's very difficult to determine how many students will actually opt into something like this. So right now we know that that group of students normally goes on to URI or a school like URI. Um, so it's, it's very hard to narrow it down to how many students would have gone under this, uh, under this uh, dynamic. We, do, we, have a, we have a rough idea of who's at CCRI now that would uh, fill that, and, and that cost is under a million dollars a year. And, and when we, if you compare it to what we would spend in just aid at URI, it's very comparable, um, except, to, except these students leave without that debt. Sure. Well, this issue marries, you know, tackling student debt crisis we have with economic development because you're providing sure. people with a vet, an opportunity for continued education, which is all about create, building our economy, which is what everyone is talking about sure. these days. It's a, it's a stimulus yeah. bill, <laughs> for sure. Well, I appreciate your time. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but you've, you've put uh, quite a bit on the table, and I, I wish you luck this legislative session as, as these issues work their way through the process. Thanks for having me, Jim. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition. that is supposed to happen today. And I said, you know what? This is a celebration. That's this right. is a celebration of a community coming together. This is a celebration of people who believe in what they're doing and to fight for it. This is a celebration for us as a community to stick together. As a new elected ward uh, council person, I am definitely, definitely feeling the stress of Bannister even thinking about leaving this community. That's this right. is a part of our community. Yes. This is what makes our community. And so this is why I'm here today. I'm here to support you. Tonight we're going to be uh, putting in an ordinance that we are uh, uh, on the behalf of the state, that the state do what's right by the Bannister House. Yeah. When I first started running at city council, uh -huh. the last thing I started looking at it was the threats. I looked at opportunities. So let's look at this today as an opportunity for Bannister House not only to become a part that's rooted in the community, but something that grows from here on. Because this should never happen to our elders. This should yes. never, never happen yes. in this country. This should never, never happen where the, 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 the voiceless are not able to speak up for themselves. But you guys are here for that reason. That's so right. I praise you today. ordinance is going to happen tonight. We would love to have you down to City Hall. If you can't make it, I understand, but that's okay. I'm here, I'm in the ward, and I'm here for anything you need. <laughs> Joined us, so I just want to introduce them, and then we're going to hear from some of our religious leaders, all right? So, where's Dulce? She's here from Women and Infants. <laughs> Secretary Treasurer Almina Thompson and some uh, staff. <laughs> Jesse's here from Jobs of Justice. This is Bobby from the Labor Room at Women and Infants over here. We got local six in the house. Where is he? Right there. Yay! So, Okay. Yes, Hopkins is here. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to the, the deacon from Ebenezer Baptist. And he's going to say a few words and give us some insight, okay? So please direct your attention to him, please. Everybody that's been here a long time probably have heard this story over and over again. 
Ebenezer Baptist Church was once on A Street. Right. They moved from A Street to this spot. And when the Roger Williams Church was donated to Ebenezer, Ebenezer gave this spot to the Patterson House. And that's been longer than all of y'all have been here because this was not built yet. I just want to give you a little history of why Ebenezer, Cornerstone, and stained glass windows came from Ebenezer Baptist Church. Now, I'm going to say a prayer. Share a prayer to connect you with what's going on now. Everybody bow, see. Father God, our Heavenly Father. We come, Father, thanking you for your grace and your mercy. And now, Father, we're asking now for a little mercy. On this walk, Father, to the State House, Father. We're asking you, Father, let your son Jesus go with us. Amen. But Father, you said in your word, if you call on my name, you will hear from me. So, Father, touch the minds and hearts of the people of the State House. Let them know, Father, that this is a business thing now. But, Father, it has always been the life of many, many people here. They have jobs on the line. Oh, Father, and their patience. Their patience, Father, they love it here. So, Father, please, Father, touch their hearts and minds, Father. Let them know that the Battle's House needs to stay open for more years than it had already been open. Oh, Father, we hope, Father, that after this is over today, Father, that somebody will come up and say, let the Battle's House stay open. Oh, Father, we just love you and we adore you. In Jesus Christ's name, I just pray for our Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m. Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. 
We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Issues. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm also your host this evening. As we begin a new legislative year, Labor Vision is going to bring in different senators and representatives to talk about different issues important to working people. And today, one of the first shows we're taping this session, we're pleased to have Representative Jay O'Grady with us. Representative, thanks for joining us. Jim, my pleasure. So you represent District 46. You are on several different committees, the Corporations Committee, Judiciary, as well as the Committee on the Environment. Yes. Um, Pleased to represent District 46 uh, and pleased to be on each of those uh, committees as well. Sure. 46 is all within the town of Lincoln? Uh, so the district is about 90% uh, Lincoln uh, and then about 10% uh, of the district is Pawtucket as well. Um, so it, it, you know, Lincoln is a community that I've represented in one form or another for the past, going on 10 years now. I first ran for town council back in 2004. Uh, and then was on the, uh, the town's budget board, um, which reports out to our financial town meeting and have been honored to serve as a uh, representative in the General Assembly for the last, well, going on my third term now. Sure. So you were elected in 2010, and I know we had you on the show a couple of years ago talking about a few different mass transit issues. How did some of that work out? Well, actually, um, you know, last session saw some, I think, uh, tremendous progress on addressing both our uh, mass transit uh, uh, system in terms of, of RIPTA and the RIDE program, which is um, the uh, American with Disability um, a component of that, uh, but also uh, we saw some progress in addressing our uh, backlog of infrastructure needs as well. Um, and I've always said that, you know, unless we can have quality infrastructure that allows the state of Rhode Island to uh, leverage its proximity to the larger markets of New York and Boston, um, you know, we're going to have difficulty attracting companies uh, to come here, particularly when there are uh, other states that are between Boston and, and New York um, that might have better infrastructure in Connecticut, I'm speaking of uh, specifically. So last year we were able to um, get some dedicated funding uh, uh, for transportation, both the infrastructure piece and the mass transit piece. Um, you know, it was years in the, in the making, uh, and uh, I'm pretty, pretty happy with the results. Yeah, we had Fuzzy Harrington of the Transit Union in on the show talking about the bond issue uh, last fall and uh, really outlining some important steps we need to make to get, have our infrastructure in place so that we can adapt and grow as, a, as an urban core where people are working. Because people talk about jobs all the time, but if you can't get people to the job locations, uh, there's going to be a problem. Yeah, no, exactly, and and uh, you've reminded me about the uh, the bond piece as well. I wasn't even referring to that. I was referring to uh, the transportation budget article mm -hmm. last year that that addressed both those issues. Uh, and it was nice to see that the bond received such overwhelming support from the voters as well, which indicates to me that transportation is not you know something that that is only the concern of uh, you know policymakers in the general assembly but is also a deeply held concern of the electorate um, so that was nice to see it sure was so there are many bills that pass the assembly that create study commissions and sometimes the commissions meet sometimes they don't but you're the sponsor of a study commission bill that uh, that you're taking very seriously and in fact the bill that passed last session has already led to some meetings of a study commission this year. Why don't you take a few minutes and let us know what the Fair Funding Formula Study Commission is taking a look at. Sure. Well, um, you know, as you know, back in, in 2010, the state of Rhode Island passed uh, a very comprehensive piece of legislation that established for the first time in uh, many years a, uh, a formula, a predictable formula through which uh, education uh, at the elementary and secondary levels uh, were funded. And uh, it essentially looked at student population, it looked at what percentage of that population uh, met qualifications for free and reduced lunch, which were proxies for, uh, for need. Uh, it looked at community wealth and the ability of communities to, um, to fund their own uh, education systems through property taxes. Uh, and it essentially 
determined on a go-forward basis what sort of state support there should be for each municipality's uh, education spend. Um, and then, uh, you know, the rest of the money required to educate a child would then be on uh, the taxpayers of, of the individual communities to fund. So in Lincoln's case, uh, you know, it was determined that Lincoln uh, can support about 60% of its own education budget, and the state should step in and, and um, uh, fund 40% of that budget based on, um, you know, this assessment of need and, uh, and a population assessment. Um, prior to the uh, uh, implementation of that funding formula, um, you know, Lincoln was at the, the um, uh, mercy sounds dramatic, but really at the whim of the General Assembly to decide what, what funding should come to the town or not. And every other town in the state was in that same position. So uh, it was difficult to, um, to budget uh, for, uh, for education, particularly when the General Assembly's uh, final budget doesn't really come out until many municipalities have already uh, established their budgets for the, for the next year. Um, so the fair funding formula was the result of, of uh, you know, years of work is, is my understanding and was adopted again back in the, the 2000, uh, 2010 session. Um, and like any major piece of legislation, it, it is really, um, you know, to the benefit of uh, taxpayers and citizens to have the General Assembly take a look at how the implementation of that has gone uh, several years down the road. Um, to see whether or not there are any unintended consequences um, that we're seeing now through, through that implementation, uh, and if so, to address them. Um, I know s some of the issues that arose right when the funding formula was being adopted was uh, a concern of some communities that um, were deemed the losers. We had winners and losers, right? Uh, communities yep. that would get more education aid based on the formula and some that would get less. And they phased in the formula. So if you were gaining, yeah, you, you only got one seventh. And if you were losing, um, that, that was spread out over um, a longer period of time. I know that was a pretty hot bus button issue at the time. And there's been bills put in every year to revisit that issue. Is that something that you're going to uh, spend much time and attention on as part of your study commission? Well, uh, it, that is not actually one of the goals of, of my study commission. Um, and you're right, that the issue that you refer to is, is uh, a tough one for some communities, South Kingston in particular, and also um, some of the communities that received essentially a consolidation bonus when uh, districts were regionalized. Uh, and that, that bonus was essentially frozen into place, although it was supposed to be a short-term solution or a short-term short incentive. Um, and so districts like uh, Bristol Warren, for example, um, really that incentive extended for years. And then when it was eliminated, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough gap to fill, um, particularly at, you know, trying times. And, sure. And sure. I, you know, I've not been an elected uh, uh, official when times haven't been trying. So that, that, might, <laughs> that might be a fun experience someday. Um, but yeah, what, what we're really looking at here is a, is a particular sub-issue of the fair funding formula, and that is the treatment of charter schools vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, uh, the sending districts. So uh, the, way, the way it works now is that uh, when a child in a, uh, in a town, let's say Lincoln, for example, opts to uh, go to a charter school instead of the traditional public school, uh, the town of Lincoln is required, and, and any municipality would be required to uh, remit to that charter a per pupil um, share of its locally supported expenditure, in addition to its entire per pupil share of the state supported expenditure. Um, and the idea, you know, said sort of in a compelling way at the time was that the funding should follow the child, and, and that's sort of how it's been explained that, you know, the funding follows the child to. Um, to a charter school, to the Met, to Davies, where have you? Um, the but, Met and the Davies being state schools as the, opposed to charters, which we actually have three different kinds. We have three district affiliated charter schools. All the teachers are uh, members of the bargain unit in both Providence and Cranston. Yep. Uh, then we have a, a host of independent charter schools. And then we have a third group, which is the Merrill Academies, which is the most recent form of charter schools in Rhode Island. Correct. Um, and so the, the, uh, 
The implication, when you say the funding follows the child, the implication there is that expenses follow the child as well. Um, so that if you, know, you have a, a, a set group of, of uh, funding that supports the education of a child and that child leaves your school, uh, then in theory, the expenses that are associated with that child would equal the loss of, of revenue when the funding follows that child. Um, but it had been explained to me um, by, by constituents, by folks on our school committee, by our, our uh, superintendent, uh, as well as others um, around the state, that that was not, in fact, the case. Um, that most of the charges, or, or a significant portion of the charges that are um, associated with children are in uh, the form of fixed costs. So these are costs in, um, for transportation, for um, facilities, for um, uh, sports, enrichment, things like that, which do not actually follow the child, um, but stay behind in the school district uh, to be shouldered by perhaps a, a decreasing number of, of kids who's, who's, um, whose revenue is staying in the school system. So it, it becomes, it becomes a, a structural issue moving forward. So, you know, I, I always give the example, I have a daughter that goes to, well, I have, I have two children actually, that go to um, Salesville Elementary School. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, uh, if someone left my daughter's fourth grade class for a charter option, uh, the town of Lincoln would essentially remit about $14,000 to that charter uh, of local spend, and then in addition to that, whatever state support um, you know, is associated with that child would also go to the charter. Um, but you can bet that it does not suddenly cost 14000 plus less to operate that fourth grade class mm -hmm. due to the removal of that, of that one child. Um, teacher still has to be paid, there are legacy costs that still have to be dealt with, the school ha still has to be heated, the buses still have to run, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so when you start to multiply that by hundreds of times, um, or in the case of Pawtucket, 1,500 times, um, you start to have a big gap between um, the tuition that's been remitted and the savings attributable to the removal of those children, um, uh, you know, whatever that number might be. I could see this being a really detailed issue that your study commission's working on. First of all, who's on the study commission? Uh, you know, it, it, it includes a broad representation of stakeholders, but let our viewers know, uh, you know, who's composed of. Sure. Well, you know, I think we went out of our way to make sure we had as broad a group of stakeholders as possible. So um, we have uh, representatives from the League of Cities and Towns. We have a representative from the Rhode Island Superintendents Association. Uh, representative from the Rhode Island School Committees Association. We have representatives from Rhode Island Mayoral Academies, um, from the League of Charter Schools. Uh, we have a representative from the Met. We have a representative from NEA. We have a representative from AFT. Uh, and there are three House members in addition to that, myself, Greg Amore, uh, and Justin Price. Um, so it, it is a, a, a broad base. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're all interested in making sure that you know, whatever unforeseen consequences there were from the implement, implementation of the fair funding formula, that we can, you know, address them now, at least vet them now, uh, and hopefully suggest, if necessary, some revisions to that formula so that our, our school systems remain strong and stable uh, moving forward. So what are the different areas of inquiry that your study commission is going to have? Sure. Well, we've broken it down into, uh, into four subtasks. Um, so the first is, is the one that I was getting at a moment ago. It's looking at the average uh, cost versus marginal savings issue. So again, when a child goes to a, uh, a charter school, their tuition is the average per pupil cost that their local district spends. Um, and that is what's remitted to the charter versus the marginal savings that result from the uh, removal of that child from the traditional school system. Um, so j just to give an example, um, the town of Cumberland ran an analysis where they looked at the 168 students that are um, uh, K through K through 8 uh, charter students. Um, and they looked at what the cost would be to reabsorb those 168 children back into the Cumberland school system. And they did it very specifically. They did it by individuals. So they looked at 
you know, where does, where does this child live? So therefore, which elementary school specifically would they need to go to? Which middle school, if they were old enough, would, would they, they need to, to hire more teachers, for example? Would if they need they to hire more back? teachers? What class would they go into? And uh, would the addition of that child cause a contract overage clause to come into an effect? Mm -hmm. And if so, how much? Um, transportation, books, all of that. Uh, and what they determined was that it would cost the town of Cumberland roughly $460,000 to reabsorb the 168 K through eight um, charter students that, are, that are, are currently going out of the district at an expense of about $2.1 million mm -hmm. in tuition. So, you know, Cumberland has exposed, just on their K through eight charter students, what they believe is about a $1.6 million differential between um, your average cost versus marginal savings. I know there's um, a lot of contributing factors to that, but one of them is the costs vary to educate an elementary student versus a secondary student, for example, where where you need more teachers when you have more course offerings in middle schools and high schools. And, and I imagine that kind of detail is one of the many things that you're going to be taking a look at then. Yeah, yep, uh, for sure. And that, that sort of plays into uh, subtasks uh, two and three. Um, and, uh, you know, j just to stick on subtask one for, for a moment, we, we've had um, probably seven or eight school districts at this point have run that sort of reabsorption analysis. And in fact, they've all been asked to. Uh, and they're returning, you know, s similar numbers. So uh, Lincoln has almost, uh, you know, the exact experience that Cumberland had with about $2 million of, of tuitions um, and about, you know, 400,000, a little more, to reabsorb those students um, that, that have gone. So, mm -hmm. uh, and we're, we're seeing those numbers play out, whether it's Charahoe or North Kingstown or, or uh, North Smithfield or Coventry or, or wherever, we're, we're seeing the same trend. Um, second, what we want to look at is, you know, getting at, getting at some of the things that you're talking about. There are some, at least from the population numbers that I've seen and the census numbers that have been reported by RIDE, there are some disparities between the sending districts uh, and the receiving charters with regard to special ed population. Uh, and uh, according to the uh, Special Education Expenditure Project out of, out of Washington, uh, it costs about 1.91 times more to educate a special education child or, or a child that is uh, char characterizes having one of the 13 special ed um, um, you know, diagnoses mm -hmm. than it does uh, a regular ed child. So if we are seeing great disparities in special ed population in the sending districts versus special ed populations at the charters, um, then the charters are uh, getting an enhanced number because the local share, the local spend that they get a piece of is inflated by special ed costs borne by the local districts but not borne right. uh, by the charter. So um, if you look at Blackstone Valley Prep, for example, they have a reported uh, special ed population of about 9%. Um, they pull from Lincoln at 18%, Cumberland at 18%, Central Falls at 20%, and um, Pawtucket at 19%. So there seems to be a disparity there, and, and we're, we're going to look at that in subtest too. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a whole lot of time oh, left, sorry. so I don't want to um, yeah. you know, neglect the, sure. the, the future agenda. So what, what's subtask three yeah, and so, subtask so, four looking yep, like? Yep, I'll, I'll get right into those. So uh, there are some costs uh, that uh, it's been at least purported that there are some costs that are borne by the local districts um, that get factored into their local spend number that, that charters get a piece of when a child attends them, but that charters will never have the obligation to fund themselves. Um, and so uh, a classic example of this would be early education uh, or early intervention services for at-risk three to five-year-olds. Um, local districts are obligated to provide those services um, they work their way into the local spend number, which charters get a piece of, but charters never provide, or at least it's been reported to us, that charters do not provide early education services themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing would apply for post-graduation, uh, 18 to 21-year-old uh, young adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, there are support services that are provided through the um, you know, budgets of the school districts Charters get a piece of that number, but mm -hmm. again, it's been reported to us that they don't provide those type of services. So we want to look at that in subtask uh, three. And then finally in subtask four, we want to 
um, look at the extent to which there is um, oversight and transparency. Um, uh, I would say that, that folks uh, who are supportive of charters refer to them as public schools of choice. Uh, and, you know, again, the implication is that there is oversight and transparency when you use the word public. Uh, certainly, I know that uh, the Lincoln School System, they fight for every dollar, every dime even, uh, before our financial town meeting each mm -hmm. year. And before they even get there, they do it before their school committee and town administrator and budget board. Um, it, uh, it, it seems to us that it should be looked at to see what kind of fights folks on the charter side have. Sure. So I feel like we've just um, touched on this, you know, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, but I understood this to be a complicated issue, and I appreciate you at least giving an overview of what you're going to be looking at. Sure. Um, your your um, study commission is meeting on regularly on Fridays, and it's on Capital TV for those who want to tune in, correct? Yeah, and Capital TV on demand for those who are up late at night, yes. <laughs> Well, uh, Representative, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your leadership on this issue. And I look forward to maybe having you or some of your colleagues back in the studio later this session so you can talk about what, what the study commission found in terms of uh, yeah. both uh, factual findings as well as recommendations. Sure. Sounds great. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Week. Uh, we've heard from many advocates of, of uh, raising the tip minimum wage, but now let's hear from one of the workers. I'd like to introduce Kate Conroy. Hi, um, my name is Kate. I'm a 31-year-old mother and a bartender and server with over 10 years of experience in the city of Providence. The subminimum wage is not a livable wage. It's a poverty wage. Tipped workers, like myself, are more likely to live in poverty and much more likely to be women. Sub-minimum wage workers, like me, do have families. The cost of living in this city rises, but our pay doesn't, and it hasn't in 20 years. Unpredictable wages have many invisible problems. It's much harder to get credit, and it's hard to get an apartment when you don't show reliable income. And there's lots of unpredictability. The managers whose whim it is, which shifts you will get. Maybe it's the same superior whose managerial work you might be doing for free. Or the unpredictable weather around here. When it snows or storms, how do you pay a babysitter that day? How much work do, will you do when you're not making tips, but maybe you're cleaning or managing for $2.89 an hour? Raising the subminimum wage would lift not only service workers out of poverty, but it would empower people raising families like myself and living in a city that's so proud of its hospitality industry to participate in the economy. I think that it's time that professional servers, bartenders, and other workers laboring for $2.89 an hour to finally get a raise. Thank you. Again, it's, it's always important to note that when a worker steps up to speak, they're facing retaliation and they can be facing new harassment. It takes a unique courage of the people to stand up sometimes. So with that, I'd like to invite Jen Steinfeld to come speak. Hi, I'm Jen Steinfeld and I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Fund of Rhode Island. And as many people have already mentioned today, this is a women's issue, with nearly t uh, three in four of the tipped workers in the state of Rhode Island being women, um, with many of them being mothers. This is a childhood poverty issue, and frankly, it's a social justice issue as well. So we are here because we don't want to see anything happen to, uh, to women who want to speak up on behalf of their own wages. Uh, we want to lend our voice to this coalition. Uh, in support of an increase to the tip minimum wage. We believe that this is a way to level the playing field for women in our state. And we know that from other states that have eliminated the subminimum wage, the gender wage gap has also declined. So we're strong supporters of this coalition and we're happy to be part of the One Fair Wage Coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, 
again, it's advocates that come forward that have do so much, but it's also the workers that this is about. So I'd like to invite a fine dining server and a very, very courageous man, Joe Fortune, to speak to the issue. Thank you for everyone that showed up today. That is a real honor to have the opportunity to speak. Um, as a server, I usually just listen, but um, I, my mother, as a single mother, raised myself and my brother while working at Hemingway's and Spatz when I was a kid. So she kind of taught me everything I needed to know about working hard in, in the restaurant industry. But I'm, my goal here is really to dispel the myth that people that work in fine dining are just making a killing and like, you know, saving money and all that kind of stuff. I mean, just because someone has a, a big table one time, that means they probably also had another shift where they might not have made minimum wage that day. And I would say if you asked, if you really looked at what servers in fine dining make, even the best ones sometimes go home without making minimum wage that day. And a lot, and most of them are mothers and fathers and things like that. I just wanted to dispel the myth that we're not all college kids uh, just making some extra allowance or something. It's people raising families and we should get at least minimum wage at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, again, the value of this is going to be lifting people out of poverty. This is really a jobs program. This is really a way to step forward in a state where we're leaving people behind. Again, the business community is on board with us, and I'd like to ask Asher Schofield to come forward and speak. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank you all for being here and uh, thank uh, Representative Regenberg and Representative Golden for putting this uh, conversation out there for us all to have. Uh, my name is Asher Schofield. I've owned and operated a business in Providence for 14 years. Um, I also co-founded the Hope Street Merchants Association nine years ago. Um, and I just wanted to uh, speak about my feelings on, on the topic of raising the uh, the minimum wage for tipped workers. Um, I think this is going to be good for business. Uh, for me, I'm a, I'm a business that is dependent on people having money, having capital in their pockets to spend and to support their local economy in this fashion. Uh, I can see a, a, you know, a substantial increase in the tipped workers minimum wage uh, affecting my business's fourth quarter uh, significantly and, and other businesses as well. Um, so. I think that uh, just to counter any potential arguments about uh, this having a negative impact on businesses, I see this as being very positive. I think this is a very serious issue that we're here to address today. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation and that we're hearing from these brave people who are able to speak up and support this. And I'm proud to be able to do that as well. Every wage increase that's happened historically has always been treated as if the sky was going to fall but the reality was that it was a rising tide that lifted every boat. We need to make sure that all of the workers of Rhode Island are included in our recovery and included in the growth. And that's why I'm urging everyone to support the One Fair Wage Coalition. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.